Hello and welcome back. This is Conversations in Artificial Intelligence. And today we have something very interesting. And we're moving from uh, the traditional AI to the field of medical science. And it's a really deep medical science. So we're gonna look at how artificial intelligence is used to monitor some of the deep functions inside the human body utilizing devices that are either implanted or they are attached to the human body and they're connected to the intelligence, the machine learning intelligence through an IoT type of um, setup. So with us today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Esan Kamrani, who is not only a scientist, but he's also an entrepreneur. And, at the mo and as we speak, is doing both research at the Harvard Medical School and starting a stealth mode company in this area of uh, monitoring human physiology and analyzing human physiology. So, Esan, how are you today? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good. I am. Uh, I'm very, very good. Okay. So, uh, where, where are you? Where are you located? Uh, you located in Boston. You you are at Harvard Medical School. So, tell us a little bit about uh, you know the everyday life. Uh, yeah, today actually, I I can't actually imagine a specific place that I'm located because I'm traveling a lot during like different countries, especially United States in Boston. Uh, and also Canada in Waterloo, uh, in Toronto, uh, and other countries like South Korea in Pohang and Seoul, and other countries that I travel usually, but is not a specific place that I can mention actually at the moment I'm living. Uh, so let's, uh, for our audience, let's you know give them some details about the Harvard Medical School campus and the work that you do, you do a lot of really deep engineering, if you like, machine learning work. How does that fit into a medical camp? So right now, everybody, like when you're thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, if you just think about connecting that to any kind of uh, fashion and actually well-known uh, kind of science and application that we are using at the moment, just a kind of making it a, a kind of a science fiction and making it a kind of a smart thing. Right now, every, everybody talking about the smart stuff, smart thing, like whenever, it, you know, the vision making it a, a smart vision, like a television making a smart television. And right now, when you try to combine the, the artificial intelligence with any of any kind of activity that we do in a campus and we do in a, actually the, 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 the normal uh, life uh, we do every day, like so making everything more uh, fascinating, making everything more fun, and at the same time making it more professional and technical in a science point of view in a, in a, in a way that we are using that in the campus. Okay, so but do you think do you think this is for you know for making it interesting to the people that work there or making it interesting to the world or it's not about the like uh, trying to making that interesting is actually it is interesting like it's a kind of so we just discovered that it, it's interesting it's not something that we try to use artificial intelligence just to make things interesting it's actually do and is that's like the nature of using artificial intelligence it means that you know, making everything to think, you know, like, uh, and when you believe that you, you give the, 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 the things that be able to think and be a smart is like, is a kind of, you feel you are communicating with those. You are communicating with your eyeglass. You are communicating with your contact lens. You are communicating with your uh, clothes and you are communicating with uh, every things that you feel in around and you feel they are all passive at the first time actually giving them a kind of artificial intelligence, uh, like it is gonna give them a kind of a life. So you are making things, I believe, live and smart and make us able to communicate with them much more uh, friendly and easily by making them smart. And that's why I believe making things more fun and making things more uh, interesting because that's communication. You can communicate with everything by giving them a kind of a taste of the artificial intelligence. That's the way I see that. 
Let's try to, you know, explain our audience what's possible today that was not possible yesterday. Particularly, we were discussing before that yesterday it was not possible, for example, monitor somebody that does a stroke and, and therefore medical doctors didn't have, one, the ability to in, intervene right away, two, the ability to study what's happening during the moment and maybe think about some way of preventing it or some way of interventing in, in advance. So can you give us kind of an overview of uh, monitoring human physiology from remote? What's happening out there? What's, what's possible today? A lot of things happening today. I mean, it's not possible to track every single thing happening every day. You know, you would just wake up and you see somebody somewhere has discovered something that helps uh, and makes things happen that wasn't possible you know, yesterday. So, but in general point of view, the way we see that um, by looking at the, the past and right now and the future of the, this kind of technology is that what has been happening as a result of all of this innovation around us, especially by using the artificial intelligence in biomedical applications, is that the diagnostics and treatment both actually have been more uh, precise, have been more efficient, and have been more uh, real-time, and even cost-effective. Like, uh, using this technology, we can get as much as information that we want, precisely, from the everywhere that we want and every point that we want. It doesn't need the patient that go in person to hospital to actually use specific devices uh, there to actually extract information and record the necessary information can do that in-home, you can actually send the information using a very small and typical devices at home, send the information to a, to a doctor, to a physician, and to a, a database remotely. And in a processing point of view, so the physician doesn't need to wait for the processing the data and processing the, the information that delivered. The diagnosis can be done right away. You know, even right now using artificial intelligence, so you can do a diagnostic if you'd be able to just send the information and do the processing, get the feedback. Uh, if your blood pressure is high, low, so you, it's, uh, and also the, the, the glucose level of the blood is high, low, how is that? So you don't need to just collect the information, send it to a physician, wait for the response, and just do whatever you have to do based on the information that we can get. We can do the diagnostic right away. And that's one of the main benefits of the technology right now. And also about the treatment as well. Like, by the way, we believe that the treatment is important, but the technology has helped a lot more in diagnostic rather than the, the treatment. And that's, I believe that's even more important in, 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 a, in a healthcare technology. And what is important, actually both the treatment and, and diagnosis are important, but diagnostics is much more important than treatment. That's much. That's why a lot of more uh, focus and a lot of more att actual attention has been more on a diagnostic side to, to get as much as information that you want, to process that right time and get a very precise and uh, accurate uh, diagnostic based on those information. So that's why we feel it uh, in, 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 in our day-to-day -day life that we can get diagnosed more precisely, more quickly, and... Uh, Based on that, we can get the treatment right away. So that makes the treatment even more efficient compared to what happened before. And in general point of view, it has improved the quality of life for everybody. We can feel it. It's not something that we can say only we in academy or we just like the researchers or physicians can feel that. I believe that everybody in the world can feel this kind of a change by seeing that this kind of uh, improving in their quality of life based on these technology being involved in their day-to-day life. So the main cost for, through this process go from like, uh, let's say traveling and like uh, traveling the patient, the, pe the patient should go to, to the hospital, should wait for a long time to, to get diagnosed and to get uh, the, the, to see the physicians at the, one of the, 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 the parts that by uh, removing this part from the, the healthcare process, we can actually help a lot of uh, actually uh, transportation and uh, waiting time in the hospital, the crowded people in the hospital, those are all paperwork stuff that are, I believe, is just not necessary, but that, that's one side of it. 
Another side of that is to, you see, sometimes the physician, based on the information that they receive from the patient, they cannot make, make a right decision. So they ask a lot of uh, biomarkers to be detected. So they send the physician, so they send the patient to, uh, let's say, uh, to have the, the, the ECG, to have the, the ultrasound, to have the, the MRI, to have, to, you know, to, to see which one of these uh, actually imagings, which one of these uh, information can help the physician to make a right decision. But using the, the artificial intelligence, we can go right to the point. So we don't need to ask physician to do a lot of actually different imagings because that's cost, the cost even cost for both the physicians and the, the healthcare uh, system because all of these, they have to be done, but not necessarily. So they are just a redundant information. By using artificial intelligence, we can go based on a very preliminary uh, information that we can see from the patient and we can hear from the patient. We can go to, right to the point. If MRI is, is the most important thing that we can diagnose only based on that, we just do the MRI. If the ECG is the only important part, so we just do the ECG. And even beside that, the period of those measurements is important. So the type of measurement is important. We are going to do MRI, we are going to do ECG, we are going to do uh, EEG. And even if we decide, okay, the EEG is important, how long we, are, we need that EEG to be recorded? How long we need that MRI, fMRI to be recorded? How long we need the heart rate to be monitored? And that period of time, that cost a lot of time and money for both, again, the healthcare system and a patient. But using the artificial intelligence, we just record, and, and also real-time monitoring, and we just uh, record the portion, the most important portion of the data. So we don't need to monitor the patient for 24 hours. We just monitor that and get information in just like the, 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 the right time that we need the information. So that's also actually very important in both the time and, and cost for both patient and healthcare technology. And also, again, uh, using this real-time monitoring can give us like more, uh, actually a quicker decision-making. Decision making is really important and actually affects both, again, the healthcare system and a, and, a, and a patient to make the decision as soon as possible. Because sometimes, you know, we have a lot of issues and problems. Even if you if you have a diagnostic but not in the right time, you can you cannot help the patient anymore. You know, the physician can't do anything anymore. But using this real time monitoring is not only just saving time, saving money, is also saving the life of the people you know, more efficient. So we, you can actually, using this technology, we can do a actually the a decision with much more accuracy, precisely in the right time. And that helps a lot. Uh, With this, what's possible today at high level? Like what physiology is possible today to measure at high level? And what is still research or still far away? So we discuss things like blood pressure, sugar, but what, what's overall what's possible and what's not possible? Like, let's give our audience a, a big overview, you know, like a top line overview of what's possible and what's instead and what it is instead object of research. About a type of the, the biomarker that we can actually detect from the, from the patient, I believe there is not that much limitation today using the, the available technology. But the main, uh, actually not possible today, uh, is come from the communication side and security side. So uh, still the infrastructures and also the, the even most hardware and software infrastructures available today to use these kind of, to collect this kind of information, send them to the physicians and get the feedback is come from more from the security infrastructure. So still the, the, the system need to be improved, need to be upgraded to deliver a more safe, more uh, reliable and more accurate actually communication between the patient, which is remotely monitored and the physicians or hospital that is receiving the information. So that's one of the main challenges today that still not possible. A lot of people are working on that side. And the second is about actually, is not just about the type of information, as I said, it's about accuracy of information. Even, even not remotely, even in person, if you go to the physician, if you go using the available devices, even for a very basic information like the heart rate and the blood pressure, those things that the, everybody may believe that they are easy to measure and maybe uh, like uh, they can do that even in the hospital. But still we have challenges and still we have a lot of problems.
with the accuracy of those kind of devices. I mean, like we are not going to talk about a, a, a novel technology, a novel diagnostic. Not even let's talk about the heart rate and blood pressure. Even those, if you use different devices, you see you don't see a, actually the uh, maybe a reliable information and the same information if you just change the device from patient to patient, from device to device. That's that's one of the main challenges. Not that, that, that actually we have it even in uh, in person monitoring that can be multiplied and that that can be magnified when we do the remote monitoring. Actually, that can actually be more highlighted when we do do a do a remote monitoring. So, uh, and we do a t t telemedicine or teleoperate actually to telesurgery or tele and diagnostics of the patient. Those kind of uh, minor challenges that we can see in a in-person monitoring and in-person uh, diagnostics, those are going to be highlighted in a, in a telemedicine because of the distance, because of the communication, and because of this security issue that I mentioned. So we can say that those are only problems that come from the remote monitoring. No, those are the problems exist even in the in-person monitoring and actually not remote monitoring, but those are just going to be highlighted when we change the type of the, uh, the monitoring, when we just change uh, the distance of, of the monitoring uh, of the patients. That's the way I believe that is still uh, not possible, and, but a lot of works and research today are uh, happening around the world to solve those issues, and I believe that hopefully can be fixed. So th this is very interesting, you know, each of these subjects would require to dip into then to dig into them with great details uh, but for you know our, our time is, is limited so i'd like to switch more into what you do and your area of uh, interest within the remote physiology monitoring and i think you do something very interesting so without you know further ado tell us a little bit at high level what are you trying to accomplish what is the new frontier that you're working on so actually my main focus on, on the device side and I like to the form factor has been more focused on the wearable and implantable technologies. And the, you know, using the wearable and implantable technologies, that's, that's I believe, it can uh, actually help uh, in a remote monitoring as well because one of the main challenges maybe in, in recording will be actually the form factor of the devices and the cost of the devices. If you want to have the device in-house, you can't pay like a couple of thousand dollars just to have a device to send the, send the information to the patient. So we using this technology, we can have a very small, very uh, cost effective devices that patient can have with them like everywhere in the house or wherever they do in a, like can wear the devices, can have the devices with them wherever they go with a very uh, actually uh, low cost. So that's have been my main focus working on this, this technology to make every actually devices that can be weared by the patient or can be implanted in the body of the patient with uh, uh, actually the minimum uh, intrusion and minimum uh, issues, minimum problem with the, with the, with the, with the patient. And uh, that has been one of the main focus of the, the form factor side. But in the technology side, my main focus has been optics and photonics. So uh, using the, 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 uh, the, the optics and photonics in, in, in medicine and biology have been around for, for a while, but one of the main benefits of using light for both diagnostics and treatment uh, is that is, it, it is one of the main technologies that can be used for long term with no side effect comparing to the other electromagnet, actually electrical or magnetic devices that are available that the, the people can't uh, use for long term monitoring and real time monitoring because if you want to do the real time monitoring, one of the main things, that main challenges is to having no effect, no side effect for the patients, but using these optical devices, uh, and we are able to do the real-time, long-term, and continuous monitoring of the, 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 the patient for now. And also in the processing side, what I have been doing for um, actually processing the information that we can get from these wearable implantable devices, and even optical the technique that we are using, how we have to process this data, and I have been using the artificial artificial intelligence to process these data that we are collecting using these devices and these technologies, and then 
uh, make decision making based on those information. It means that we can diagnose the um, uh, right time and actually in a in a very efficient uh, way. Okay, Asan, this uh, this uh, uh, sector is uh, very interesting because you know when healthcare and application to healthcare come into play, people are extremely interested to this and. Uh, what I would like to do now is go a little bit deeper and, and kind of identify the benefits of using implantable technologies. Why do we use implantable technologies and when do we use implantable uh, technologies to measure uh, physiological parameters from uh, human beings? So, uh, as you know, the implantable technology can be used for both monitoring and treatment side, like and also as uh, artificial organs, uh, replacing the, the 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 normal organs of the, and and parts of the, the human body. But in a monitoring point of view, uh, which I believe is the more main focus of this conversation, is that you know when we just want to have a continuous real time monitoring of the patient, for sure we have to have a device attached to the person. So we can't use anymore the, the device in a hospital and technologies available in specific places. So we have to attach the device to the, to the patient. So in that case, there is no way instead of just using wearable and fiber technology. And in some cases, we can't use a wearable. That's the only option is to go through the, the implantable technology to implant the, the, the monitoring device, the monitoring tool inside the human body. With what that, is one of such case? Sorry? What is one of such cases? One example. Okay, one example. Like let, let's say that when we are gonna have a first small actually the stents. So you we have a cardiovascular stent and actually gastrointestinal stents available in in, in everybody's. Uh, uh, so everybody in, in medicine maybe have be familiar with that. So in those such cases, we can't do any treatment. We can't use any other option instead of using just like catheters, like or do a surgery or using these implanted actually uh, stents inside the human body. So there is no other way available. So we have no other option instead of just doing a surgery, open the body, like place the stent inside the inside the vein or inside the, in, inside the gastrointestinal uh, in, intestinal, uh, uh, part of the body to actually keep that part of the body open, like, and then monitor and track any kind of activity that happened there, let's say for cancer, for like the, the photodynamic therapy and for other options, like for other treatment that we can have in this case. So uh, there is no other option available. So that we can do the monitoring and we can do the, the treatment uh, real time and continuously without having a patient in a hospital, without having a patient uh, with physicians. So this is one of the, one of the other, one of the option, or let's say that uh, we have also a lot of other like uh, pacemakers, like you no know, available, these kind of a pacemakers, for example, they, so they can't, they, they have to be attached because that's, they have to work real time. They have to work continuously and they have to work precisely. So these actually uh, kind of, uh, the main factors of using and having obligation of using implantable devices, as I mentioned, is using continuous monitoring, using precise monitoring, and using a bedside and like long-term monitoring of the patient. So with that, uh, and to achieve these three in the same technology, in the same device, today or up to days, there has been no other option instead of using the, the, the implantable devices that is gonna be placed right away in the attached to the, the, to the place that you have to have the, 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 the device and have to have the monitoring. So how much of this is you know, research and how much of this is a real applications today in the marketplace? For implantable devices is not only a research anymore today. So we have, you can see a lot of implanted devices inside uh, like a, a lot of... I, I specifically allude at the monitoring, at the real-time monitoring. How much of this is still, you, you know, like it's still object of research and how much has, has it really flown into practical so, applications? So, okay, in, in, in that in part of treatment, yeah, the, the, it's more actually uh, common to have uh, implantable devices. But in, in, a, in a monitoring side, to be honest, these days still people try and prefer not to have, you know, you, you know for diagnostic, prefer not to have a surgery to place uh, 
uh, you know, place a tool, place a device inside their body, and they prefer to, if possible, using just even they can uh, they, they can pay more to go to physicians, and they can even uh, use an alternative if, uh, of wearable devices. They can sacrifice some precision, but uh, they prefer because they are afraid of having a surgery to place the, the implantable device inside the body. Right now, more research is going on in this side to make it more, uh, to implanting devices uh, in, inside the human body, make it more in, actually less intrusive, make it less uh, uh, expensive and make it more quick for everybody that has been actually using this device. So in the, in the monitoring point of view, I believe still we, have, we are a little bit far from uh, the real application of the implantable devices that can be used only for monitoring. But yeah. if the people have no other option, and if that's the, that's just like, they would do the treatment, so they have no option, they go, they go with the uh, implantable options, but not if just for a monitoring. They prefer not to do that. They are a bit actually afraid of that. What would be a situation, a, you know, a diagnosis or a, or a, a situation where it would be optimal and better than anything else to have an implantable device just for monitoring purposes? Why should I stick something inside of my body? What would, what would it give me? If, like, what is the one case where, let's say, the, the, the benefit is, is overwhelming? Um, superior than you know the, the not putting it. So what I believe and the way I see that right now, if you don't have to, and if that's not the only option, the people usually don't prefer to choose that option. But as I said, like, uh, well, what we are trying to do here using that, like, is that we have to convince the people, we have to convince ourselves first that with other option, we can't get that accuracy that we needed. Other option like wearable devices or our devices available. If you don't have any other option, we go with that. So that's, um, as I said, uh, the precision is one of the main important factors. Let's say for blood pressure, if you don't have any other option, instead of using intrusive uh, or using uh, actual implantable devices, we have to go with that. So for today, is a bit difficult to convince the, the people and convince the system that we have to use a implantable device. And I believe that's right because, you know, there are a lot of challenges. So there are a lot of actually side effects of using the, the implantable devices that, ha that the technology has, has to solve. It's not only about the acceptance of the people because when you use implantable devices, especially for long-term monitoring, we have to to, to fix a lot of issues. Let's say it should be biocompatible. It should be like, it's not about only one time surgery. It needs maintenance. It needs uh, like uh, regular maintenance. It needs uh, actually to be monitored, to be checked every uh, like week, every, even some in some device every day, that be sure that the device that has been implanted in the body is in the right place. It's doing well. And even for, let's say, where actually the power supply side of these implantable devices is also important because usually the lifetime of the, the battery is, is too short and the way that we have to energize these, these, these uh, actually devices is uh, also challenging. So I believe is something about uh, the technology that has to, be f to fix this issue that we be able to deliver a very reliable and very uh, efficient uh, implantable devices to be replaced other options. So it's, it's, it's a lot of challenge in both the technology side, the patient side, the physician side, and also, as I mentioned about the security side as well. So that's uh, definitely very interesting. Uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, conversation. We have uh, our limit in, in time here. And uh, what I like to look into right now is, okay, so we have all these, um, some of, of them are pioneering technologies. Some of them are well-established uh, techniques to monitor uh, virus functions in the human body. And uh, the data that we collect, they go to this, if you like, machine learning intelligence. Now, what does that intelligence allow to do today that was not possible yesterday? Like, what is the 
benefit uh, that usually it's brought about by machine learning? What, what is the one thing that you would say today is better than yesterday when, when we look at processing that data? So what I can say, if you say just, uh, there is no a unique word to say that, but if I have to say just one word, I can say independent diagnostics. The independent diagnostics and independent uh, like healthcare, that's one of the important, the can, and can bring a lot of benefit uh, with it. And is that, you know, the, when, the ha when the device can independently be able to measure the, the data, process the data, and make a decision based on the data that has been collected and processed, that has a lot of value, and that saves a lot of money, time, and actually uh, uh, a lot of, it can fix a lot of issues that are uh, actually we are facing, the, the healthcare is facing today. So for example, even for, for, for implantable devices that you mentioned uh, specifically, so what happens today is that the, the, the implantable devices for monitoring collect the data and those data are stored in the, in the device and those data has to be transferred to the, to the physician or healthcare uh, uh, center to be processed later. And even with having that device implanted in the body, still there are a lot of, of course, a lot of other process that has to be done by other people. And that's make it difficult and make it time consuming and actually, actually brings a lot of cost for both the patient and the healthcare system. But if you can imagine, if you have the implantable devices actually occupied and uh, with built-in artificial intelligence inside it, that implantable devices can act as independent diagnoser for us, can act as an independent device that can do everything for us without the help of any other person or without actually uh, uh, doing any other extra process. So the, the, that, that, in, that artificial intelligent based implantable device can collect the information, can do the diagnostic in a point of care without any other effort and extra, and can actually even do the treatment in, 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 in the same place. So because right now, but the, the, using the artificial in, intelligence we can have also that we didn't have before is ha helping to have a, play a kind of device that can both do the diagnostics and also the, the treatment. Using the same device, using the same place, that, that's something that actually one of the, also the, the new benefits of using this artificial intelligence that has actually, without that, we haven't been able to, to realize using the previous and, and uh, conventional technologies and devices that we had before. That's, that's one word, but as I said before, if you want to explain that a little bit more and if you want to look at the other benefits of using artificial intelligence, as I said, one of our, our stuff in, uh, that comes also with this independent diagnosis, independent medicine, independent healthcare system is that uh, the accurate medicine, the precise medicine, precise healthcare, and also the, the on-time diagnostics, on-time uh, healthcare uh, providing, and also helping a lot in, a, in a having a cost-effective device, having a more efficient device uh, that can be used for everybody. And also, one of the other things that I mentioned is that makes, as I said, having artificial intelligence added to anything, any offline device, any normal device, is to make it communicatable, make it smart it means that we are able to communicate with it so if you have the any biomedical devices implantable devices that we be able to easily communicate with it it means that we are more comfortable with it so we are we can more trust to those kind of devices that have been implanted inside the body because we can communicate with them much more easily so that's the kind of uh, things that actually is in a social side as well not only a technology side not only a healthcare side is it make it easier to be accepted by the by the people? You know, is is a bit difficult for for people to accept the devices that they're it's complicated, is hard to communicate with. But using the artificial intelligence, we can make the device talk. You can make the device uh, actually think. When we can make the device uh, communicate with us and with other um, um, actually communication devices around us much more easily and much more efficiently.
So uh, here is, uh, you know, it's something that I like to learn. It's, if you like, it's a little bit more technical. Is and it's the following one. When we look at the machine learning aspects of uh, analyzing the data and then come up with the diagnosis, is there research going on into really improving the machine learning or most of the research is in incorporating the machine learning? So do you use specialized algorithms? Do you use um, new machine learning to do this type of applications? Or, you, or most of the research is basically trying to apply machine learning to this, try to apply existing machine learning to this sector and maybe finding a way to consume less energy. Where is okay. Like where, what, where are the technical innovations around machine okay, learning? So, so for sure, so to have innovation and to have an efficient device, we can't rely on uh, available and conventional and typical techniques on the, of the machine learning. Why? What is good about them? So Why we cannot? That's not enough. That's not enough. Because what is good about the machine learning is that it, it, it's actually built itself. Like it's, it's like a kind of a, if you have an algorithm, if you use it for a specific application, you can come up with a new algorithm, specifically more efficient, and, it, and with that application itself. So it's going to be trained. So the training is not just going to change the way of using that technology. It's going to help you to come up with a new framework, with a new technique as well. So that's why we cannot just rely on a, like uh, just what is available. So yeah, we can start with that for sure, but especially for healthcare monitoring. So we have to come up with a new technique. The reason, as, as I mentioned, the, one of the main reasons is that the nature of the artificial intelligence itself. And the second is that the artificial intelligence dedicated and actually more efficient for, uh, for healthcare application hasn't been well developed yet. So we don't have any available model specifically and more efficiently works just for healthcare system, just for a diagnostic application. And that's one of the need today for this technology and for having artificial intelligence more uh, usable and more efficient and more very really well uh, actually implantable and implemented in, in, in the current uh, healthcare technology. That's why, that's one of the needs in this technology. And well, what what exactly is, uh, is the need? What is the gap? Is the gap in precision? Is the gap in computational power? Is the gap in handling more uh, data inputs, where is the gap? So we can't call it a gap because, you know, when you talk about artificial intelligence, there are actually a numerous applications. There is no limit for application for that. It can be used in any industry. It can be used in anything. That's, that's the nature of artificial intelligence. And you can see that, like, if you want to just use that in just very specific and particular application like a healthcare, and even in healthcare, if you want to use artificial intelligence for diagnostic, if you want to use that for uh, like the treatment of a specific disease, and based on different the nature of different uh, behavior of different part of the body, even when you guys, you're going to use artificial intelligence for a cardiovascular, or when you want to use that for a, a neurology, uh, when you was you want to use that in a, in a psychiatry. I believe for every one of even these specialty, we need a specific model, we need more study, we need more uh, dedicated technology to be actually used uh, uh, efficiently for that part of, it, part, part of technique. I believe we can't call it the gap because that's uh, uh, all the technology is, is, is novel, we can see it's still a gap, but there is something that is in progress and I believe it's gonna uh, help everybody a lot is when you do research a lot of research has been started using artificial intelligence in healthcare technology these days and i believe what you call it the gap is is actually already has been started to to be filled and that gap if i call it the gap is the like uh not enough research not enough uh, uh well developed and not enough trust to artificial intelligence especially in a physician side and especially in healthcare side because still is, is, is a bit hard, is a bit difficult to, to, to convince the physicians, to convince the healthcare system that the decisions that the artificial intelligence system based is, is going to make is reliable, is trustable. And that's one of the, the, the challenges that I see uh, 
is actually progressive and is going to be uh, fixed hopefully uh, soon. So, Asen, this is all very interesting, and you know, like I love to have time to to go into the more details of the machine learning here and what is specifically requested for uh, implantable medical devices. However, as we go to the end of the of our time today. I like to ask you if a young person, if uh, you know some recent graduate or, or even somebody who's younger and has an interest in this field, what would be your advice for them to you know pursue a career in this field or, or having an impact in this field? What would you tell them? So uh, like I I believe there are maybe two types of interest in this field. So one is in a te technique and technology. It means so the nature of AI. Some people are trying to and are interested to learn artificial intelligence. And some people are trying to learn the application and actually implement the application. Like having these two at the same time is going to be a, quite different. So what I propose and what I suggest for the people who are interested working on, on this area is that, first of all, they have to decide which one they have more experience, which one they have more interest, to more focus on a technology side or more focus on application. Of course, later on, maybe if they work well and later they can have experience in both sides, but starting with both may be a kind of more difficult. So what I suggest is to maybe more focus on a technology. If, if, they, if, they, if, they, if they have somebody, if they have somebody that knows very well the artificial intelligence, they can go with the application side. But if not, I suggest to learn the technology first. It means the, 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 the nature of the artificial intelligence, the basics of the artificial in intelligence. And then also working closely with the, with the physicians, working closely with the healthcare system, because they cannot do anything in the healthcare system without being connected directly with the physicians, with the hospitals, with the, with the disease. So uh, the main way, the, the main efficient way that they can work for them for they have to decide which field they are going to focus first. And then they have to team up. They have to be, try to connect to the expertise in the, in the field, expertise in the healthcare system, let's say physicians. They can't do anything alone. They have to work with them. They actually, they have to see what their problem is. And when they hear what the problem is, they have to be able to propose a solution for that problem. Because just working on a technology, just working on just, let's, just, let's say, I'm going to do, uh, artificial intelligence in ECG. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do combined uh, artificial intelligence with uh, EEG. That's not gonna help uh, at all. That's a very complicated, that's a very actually uh, general uh, research point of view that they are gonna be dived and they are gonna go nowhere. But the best way to go right in the point is to start with talking with the physicians, to start with talking with the healthcare providers to see what their problem is and when they come up with a list of the problem, they, they have to choose which problem is their priority and then try to propose a solution using artificial intelligence for those problems. It means if they try to, to go this problem oriented and also the, the healthcare, real, realistic healthcare oriented uh, scenario, that helps a lot even for them to go faster to the point and helps uh, people more efficiently and helps uh, and even you know having the product that the people are going to sell they are going to going to buy it the people are going to uh, use it because i I, ha I know a lot of students a lot of researchers going in this field doing something just because they think if if they just combine artificial intelligence with something in in a, in, a, in healthcare is going to be uh, useful it's going to be interesting but that's not the correct way to 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 go and um, that's my uh, actually main uh, suggestion for the people that are can, and are interested to, that they want to do something in this field to do in that way. And we are also happy to help anybody that is interested to do anything here. Here and we have a lot of open problems. We have a lot of also open positions for the actual people that are going to do research in this field. Uh, we are happy to help uh, anytime and. Uh, <laughs> so then I put the title of my video, it's going to be Harvard Medical School Research Looks for Students. 
<laughs> so, uh, Isan, this is so interesting. I think uh, to you know to to do just ties of this topic, we would have to talk for ten hours. Uh, there are so many oh, uh, different sure. directions, and uh, the entire machine learning thing. I would have loved you know to go into the details of what really is different between, let's say, an e-commerce problem and and the, and the healthcare problem. However, our time is limited, so I wanted to. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for your time uh, today. For our audience, this is a pretty large um, topic, uh, so we try to cover, you know, give you an overview of how and where machine learning is used. But it's really lots of the interview is going into identifying the healthcare um, opportunities for uh, monitoring uh, patients' health in various ways from the wearable to the implantable devices and uh, if you have any questions please comment on the video below and uh, if you have suggestions about specific areas of uh, uh, you know uh, healthcare application or artificial intelligence this case is really about monitoring health if you have uh, specific requests please let me know and if you have questions for Asan, uh, just uh, share them with me and I will uh, convey them to him if he has time to, to answer. So, Asan, thank you so much. It's a pleasure Good. having you here. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thanks for your time. It was a really great pleasure talking to you today. And uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>